Hey, this is Tom Sheehan from Axe to Grind, Indecision, Most Precious Blood, and you're listening to The New Scene. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The New Scene. I am your host, Keith, and we're back with another brand new episode. And in the guest host chair tonight, I've got Greg Peterson of Shy Low. Greg, say hello. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Yes, Greg, it's wonderful to have you here as a first-time guest and guest co-host. You are a member of a wonderful post-metal slash post-rock band, Shy Low. And uh, li- folks, listen, if you haven't heard the band, I really recommend it. You got to check it out. Tell us a little bit about yourself and the band, Greg. Yeah. Um, I, myself, and Zach uh, Bryant are kind of the original members. I guess we started uh, out of the frame of another band called Vessel um, back in 2010 or 11. And then um, that formed into Shiloh just because we... We're about to go on our first tour in 2000. Uh, yeah, I guess it was 11 or 12. And uh, we were like, yeah, we sound different. We don't have vocals anymore. So we kind of need to change our name and came up with something pretty quickly after seeing a street sign. Nothing, nothing to the name too much. The street sign was spelled S-H-I-L-O-H. So it wasn't even the same. Uh, we just decided to put a comma in there and put two words that sounded cool at the time. And yeah, here we are. I like the name. It's very unique. How how did did you have a hard time naming the band, Greg? You know, my band that I'm putting together now, we can't seem to agree on a name and I don't know what to do. Um, yeah, I mean there was a couple names that we had. Uh I think Brisbane was one. We were uh there's there's a couple others that I can't can't even remember anymore. And then um Zach just put out there Shiloh and we're like, all right, well, let's uh see if we can figure out some weird iteration of it, I guess. And then we're just like, all right, well, let's throw a comma in there. And that's what it is. I like it. It's it's like completely unique. You know, if you Google that, especially with the comma, you can only find you. Yeah, uh, a lot of common mistakes that keep happening uh, still. Well, less likely now, unfortunately, but uh, everybody sees shy and then a comma and then low. And I uh, think that the band low is playing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's unfortunately not the case, just us. Well, listen, people are going to get it right soon enough. I'm sure of that. But listen, everybody, we've got a very exciting show for you today. Our interview subject this week is the one, the only, Cat Moss of Scowl. Now, if you haven't heard Scowl, they're an amazing new and upcoming punk band out of California. They're all over the place these days. They're on a lot of incredible tours. They just got off a stadium tour with Limp Bizkit, if you can imagine that. The band is great. Cat was great. And that conversation is coming up shortly. Scowl, Greg. Scowl. Yeah, it's sweet. I'm new to what it. What do you think of the band? I hadn't really heard of them. Um, I had some friends. I texted after you know, you and I previously t- t- talked about it, and I asked if they knew, because I knew that it'd be up their alley, and... They were like, yeah, I know about this, man. I was like, oh, man, I've been sleeping on this for a while. But no, I I put it on, and I think I've listened to all 15 minutes of the record probably three or four times straight uh, in the past two or three days. And um, I'm excited to see what else they put out. Yeah, they're re- they are really awesome. It's like straight up punk hardcore. It's not too punk. It's not too hardcore. It's more of like the traditional punk hardcore sound. And the the music is great. And, you know, I, I, I first got wind of Scowl because, you know, I'm deep in the trenches of PR emails and updates and uh, videos being passed around. And I would just see their name a lot. And before I even heard them, I would see pictures of them. And Kat would just always catch my eye. She was wearing something, always wearing something really interesting. You know, I see like this, this hardcore band playing this heavy music. And then I see this woman in a like a dress and white boots. And I'm like, wow, like the juxtaposition of these two things is so cool. And I really liked her fashion sense. And I really like her whole aesthetic. I really like the music. 
And look, you're, you're going to hear about all of it. We cover it all in this conversation, and that's coming up shortly. But first, here's how you can support me, The New Scene. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at New Scene Pod. Follow our YouTube channels. We've got a main channel with full shows, a clips channel with clips from our favorite episodes, and a gaming channel. Reviews. Five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and five-star reviews on Spotify. We could always use more of those. Thank you all so much for your support. Oh, and uh, we also have shirts at Death Wish Inc. If you want a shirt, head on over to Death Wish Inc. and pick up a shirt. Also, don't forget to support Iodine Recordings. Casey himself from Iodine Recordings will be joining me for a Best of 2022 show. We'll each be presenting our top 10 records of 2022, and that's going to post sometime in the next two weeks, so look out for that. Okay, so, Greg, let's talk about what we're listening to. I want to know what you're listening to. Lay it on us. Oh, man. Uh, It changes every single day. When I'm at work, I work in a warehouse, and I also work at a children's museum, so kind of can zone out a little bit, and I'll listen to anything from uh, soft bands like Hammock and, um, you know, instrumental stuff. And then there's other days where I'm listening to this band called Gulch that I like. There's a band called uh, Sumac, Zeta. There We uh, got to play with them earlier this year, and they stayed at our house. And a very, very, very incredible, talented band that I wish everybody would check out and or just watch live or in a YouTube video because it's insane. Who is it? Zeta? Zeta. Z-E-T-A. All right. I got to check that out because if you like Hammock, I trust your taste, Greg. Hammock is my all-time favorite band. Absolutely love them. Currently bugging them to come on the show any way I can because they got a new album coming out. Awesome. Awesome. The best. Well, Zeta and Hammock are very different, but uh, either way, they're, they're great. So it's it's awesome. That's awesome. Well, my recommendations this week are number one, Hammock. <laughs> They've got two new singles out, Procession and Love in the Void from their upcoming newest LP, Love in the Void. I love everything I've heard so far. And Hammock makes me nuts in in the best way. Like, I just have so much emotion and history and everything tied up and listening to this band. They can do no wrong. I'm really looking forward to this new record. And Greg, uh, not to put you on the spot too much, but I'm also going to recommend Shiloh, Snake Behind the Sun. Wow. What a record. I I love this kind of stuff, like the, the post-rock slash post-metal, uh, just, just that whole sound. I'm big into instrumental music and you guys are really doing it very well awesome thank you so much listen check back in with me and greg in segment three we'll talk more about cat i'll talk to greg about shiloh we'll talk about how we are doing we'll cover it all but right now we are going to speak to cat moss of scowl enjoy all right we are here now with cat moss cat Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Yes, Kat, it's wonderful to have you here. And you know what? Thank you for making the time to come on the show because I've been reading a lot about you and you seem to be the busiest person in music today. Uh, You know, I would hope so because otherwise I need to get a job. (laughs) (laughs) You're very busy. You're doing all kinds of crazy things stadium tours with Limp Bizkit. You toured the UK, you've done full US tours, you've got other tours coming up, you've played with some of the greatest bands out there today, you've got an amazing record out, How Flowers Grow. And look, we're going to cover all of that. But first, let me ask you, Kat, how are you doing today? Doing all right. It's a, it's a really gloomy, rainy day in Santa Cruz, where I live, which is not normal. It's pretty abnormal, but I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying a little bit of a different flavor and like actually experiencing some weather. Yeah. Is rain rare up uh, (laughs) in Santa Cruz like it is down in Southern California? Um, I wouldn't say it's as rare as Southern California. I feel like people literally lose their minds like in LA if it starts raining here. uh, People are a little bit more welcoming and like excited about it. But it's not like super common. I feel like our winter kind of hit kind of late this year anyways. So I'm I'm relishing it. I'm super stoked. 
So I, I guess you're home. You're not touring yeah. right now. Yes. Yeah. That's got to feel good, right? It feels great. I, I love touring so much, but it feels great to be home. What do you do to unwind when you're not on the road? Huh. Um, Probably DoorDash food and like watch TV or movies and like sit inside and just chill. I I really wasn't someone who enjoyed doing nothing for a long time in my life. Like I could not stand to sit still in my house. But since this last year, I've really truly enjoyed the art of doing nothing. It's it's awesome. Yes, I have also discovered the the art of doing <laughs> nothing. And it's same as you. When I when I had nothing going on, you know, I, I wanted to be out all the time. I wanted to be with people all the time. But now that I'm constantly busy, my favorite thing is to also well, I Uber eats food. Oh yeah. And uh, I eat it and I watch TV. And my favorite thing is to just be watching Twitch or TV or whatever and just pass out while watching it in bed. Yeah. That's, that's like a drug to me. It like lulls you to sleep. It's it's something about it. It's really special. I I love that feeling. And Santa Cruz is really nice. I visited there for the first time because uh, I have a friend who lives up there. I was out there for work. Really nice. I like that whole boardwalk area. Oh, yeah. And of course, that's where Lost Boys took place. Yes. So there's there's a historical reference as well. Santa Cruz is classic. I, I do. I have my qualms with Santa Cruz because it's definitely like a tourist attraction town and it's a college town and it's very small but packed full of people. But I love it. It's beautiful. You don't really get many places like this in the world. How long have you been there? Uh, about four and a half years. And what brought you there? Um, honestly, I just needed to get out of my hometown. I grew up in a, like a suburb of Sacramento. So just Northern California, suburbia. And it was cool, you know, but uh, <laughs> I needed I needed to be around like other young, like minded people. And my boyfriend Malachi, who plays in Scowl, he lived here. And when I met him, I just started visiting a lot and it made sense to be here. So that's kind of what drew me. That's cool. Yeah. And I think it's good to get different experiences, you know, different cities, different towns, whatever it is, wherever you're living. Like living in multiple different cities has really expanded my mind and opened me up to different things. Absolutely. I mean, we're human beings and naturally we're travelers. We, are meant to explore and whether that's like urban exploration and like, you know, living in different places, touring, traveling, or, you know, like hiking and, and experiencing nature. Like it's, it's in our own human nature to do that. So I, I try to, you know, I try to respect that aspect of myself and really like fulfill that. Absolutely. So let's talk about your history with music. Have you always been super into it? Yeah, I love music. I I don't think I like started out with not a very good taste of music for a long time in my life. Um and I I you know, I didn't start out like super punk. Like I didn't know all the cool stuff for a long time. But when I did find out about it, it was like it changed my life. It shook my whole world and it kind of felt like I had been waiting for that moment, like it was supposed to happen or like written in the stars. <laughs> like I was like, I was supposed to discover punk all along, you know, um, but I was always really driven by music. I always, you know, when I was really young, wanted to direct movies. Like I had like this idea that I wanted to direct movies, but I was really, really obsessed more so just like adding music to emotional scenes, you know, and, and things like that. Like I always obsessed with music. That's so weird. That's like the same thing I wanted yeah. to do. Yeah. I wanted I wanted to direct films and I got super into music and my favorite thing to do is pair music with scenes. Yes. Like uh, you know, I I make content for other things and I'll pair music with gameplay footage or videos yeah. that I make and it's the I think I'm really good at it. I I, I think yeah. Hollywood should hire us <laughs> to do that. Yes, we, absolutely. we're probably really good. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's all about capturing that emotion with the music and I mean, when I was a kid, you know, I discovered YouTube and stuff like I figured out how to like edit my own little videos and post them on YouTube and they're somewhere out there. I hope no one finds them. But regardless, <laughs> like I got really into focusing on that timing of like drums and emotional lyrics and build up. And and I think it kind of primed me to get to this point now where I can 
maybe write a mediocre song or two. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, I would not say mediocre at all, but look, we're going to get there. Yeah. Um, you mentioned starting out liking music and liking stuff that wasn't that cool. Now, define that for me, because I'm thinking about, like, when I got into music, I got into top 40, which I guess I would have made fun of at one point. But now that I think about that music, I think it's cool. Like, Richard yeah. Marks, Boys Two Men. Oh. Like, I, I go back, uh, Soul Asylum, I go back mm-hmm. and on that stuff and listen to that stuff on YouTube now. And I'm like, wait, this is actually good. Yeah. So I've done a full circle now. I've done the full circle as well. Like, I would, I would say, like, speaking from a punk elitist mindset yeah like a lot of the music i liked growing up a lot of music i still like is like totally not punk but i don't really care about that mindset anymore like i don't really care about what's cool or what isn't cool when i first you know my first favorite band ever as a kid that i was like just could not get enough of was the beatles and we all know like it was really cool to hate the beatles for a long time in punk world yeah um, yeah. <laughs> but I've, I've stood by my love for the Beatles and how important and influential they are on me and also just music as a whole. And then I would say probably my favorite band of all time is My Chemical Romance. Like I can't stop talking about how amazing they are. And like, I don't feel embarrassed to say that at all. There might've been a point when I got really deep into punk where I didn't want to tell anyone that because yeah. it was like, you know, that was the band that, you know, kids in your class listened to. And that's not a bad thing. That means those kids are listening to that and then hopefully eventually listening to the Misfits, you know? Yeah. And here's the thing with, with I've given the Beatles a really hard time on this show and I don't <laughs> anymore. I'll keep it short, everybody, since we're talking to Kat here. Yeah. I think I have more have more of a problem with their, their fans. Oh, totally. Than the, yeah. Than the actual band. And My Chemical Romance, I went through the same thing where I hated anything that was popular or stuff like that, but I can respect bands now for who they are, even if I don't listen to them a lot. Yeah. My Chemical Romance came up just like any of us. They played Mm -hmm. basement shows with Thursday and everybody else, and they reached the heights that they did, and I respect what they do. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of just one of those things that you can't really pin, put a finger on, on what it is or how it happened, but these are people who are hardworking musicians and hardworking artists who, you know, believed in themselves enough and worked hard enough and they got to that point. And I think it's extremely beautiful and an extremely inspiring, you know, as a young person seeing that happen, like watching their life on the murder scene documentary and seeing them like in a van touring nonstop, like 10 year old me was like, I want to do that. And now here I am <laughs> kind of mad at 10 year old me because I'm doing it. And I'm like, really wasn't that great, buddy. But I love it so much. Like I really can't get enough of it. So you are really doing it. Oh, yeah. I I looked through your tour schedules uh, (laughs) recently. And I was just like, wow, wow. Yeah, it's crazy. So you're 10 years old, you decide that you want to do this somehow. Mm -hmm. How does that start to become a reality? I mean, 10 years later, I started to actually get to know some people in like a DIY scene. I didn't even know a DIY punk scene existed for the longest time because my introduction to live music was like my first concert was One Direction. My my first time like really getting into like heavy music and, and punk music, pop punk was like Warp Tour and, and going to shows like if you grew up in Sacramento, you know about the Ace of Spades. It's kind of like the big venue there you know there's a big barricade things like that so i was going to shows like that for a long time a few years and really loved it but i didn't feel close to it like i i loved the music i loved the artists the bands but i didn't feel close to it and like i didn't feel close enough and then i had some friends going to college in like chico north in northern california it's a college town I started going to some DIY punk shows in Chico that my my best friend was going to college there. He was like, come out, come out to these shows. There's some really cool hardcore bands. And I was like, okay, cool. Um, checked it out. It was really fun. It was so cool, like being in such a small room and, and being like right there, you know? And, and it kind of dawned on me that I could do this too. I could play in a band too. So it just got to that point where I started to, go regularly, get to know people, get to, you know, you create those friendships, you you go out to shows, and maybe you go to a couple shows alone. And then the next couple shows, you know, some people and you go with them. And, 
and so on and so forth. And it grew into this thing. And that's how I met Malachi who plays in scowl. And, um, he books tons of shows in San Jose and Santa Cruz. I started coming to shows in Santa Cruz, got to know the dudes in drain, um, got to know a lot of bands that are local to here and created these really lasting friendships. And then scowl was born and it just kind of kept going from there. And, and now we're at this moment that's kind of like erupting and no one knows what to expect. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's really erupting. It's great. Yeah. That's good. It sounds like you didn't have, and you tell me, but it sounds like you didn't have too much of a time as a woman in the scene finding like-minded individuals to be friends with and start a band with, yeah. which is great because I don't know, it was, I guess it was more rare when I started going to shows in the late nineties, like the only two bands I can think of offhand fronted by women were this band Fast Times from Jersey and Walls of Jericho. Yeah. So it was like male dominated. It still is. Mm -hmm. And it was, I guess it was just more rare. Yeah. I mean, even when I got into it, you know, I, I really realistically got into hardcore about five or six years ago now, I guess, like really started to get aware of things. And there was still like only a handful of active bands at the time that were, you know, DIY hardcore bands that that was the moment when I found out about, you know, Firewalker, Jawstruck, um, Crime Watch, um, Gouge Away, I'm trying to think, there's a couple others, but um, those were bands I was like, wow, they're doing it. Like, I want to do that too. You know, they, they made it real to me that I could even step into that position and, and pick up a microphone and scream into it. I didn't really think that was an something I could do. And I wasn't quite musical growing up. I, I never played an instrument. I'd never played and, you know, I scowls my first band. Um, I did choir in freshman year, but that's about it. Like I really had no experience being a performer. Yeah. So it was a little in intimidating <laughs> to say the least. I bet. Yeah. Like how was it in the beginning when you're first getting together the, to yeah. play and you have to like yell into the microphone? <laughs> I mean, what was that like? It was so scary and embarrassing. And <laughs> I'm just one of those people that like I've, I've learned now how to talk to people and how to, you know, be ready to do these, like do a podcast, do an interview, speak into a microphone, you know, address a crowd. And then also like sing and yell and, and perform. But that wasn't always something I was naturally capable of doing. It took a lot of work. I would say the first six months to a year of us being a band, like I had no stage presence. Like I, I would turn my back to the crowd and sing because I was so shy and, and scared of the attention and like kind of scared of taking it, you know? But I did, I just kept jumping in the deep end. It was kind of like getting on a roller coaster every time we played a show and scaring myself so much. But I was like, I have to do it again. I have to prove myself I can do this and that I can work through this and be this version of myself that like I really want to be, that I know is inside of me. How do you improve? Like, do you see yourself and think, oh, I have to do that? Or is it just repetition? Like, how do you get feedback and, and improve yourself as you're going through the process? I am definitely sensitive to feedback nowadays. I've always been, I'm, I'm a, I got big feelings, you know? And yeah, I'm, I, I hear that. Yeah. And, <laughs> and it's, it's hard to hear like when, you know, it's hard to hear constructive criticism at times, but I'm still very open to it. I, I really appreciate honesty. That's something I, I stand by. For me, it's being able to listen to live videos. Like sometimes it's really hard to watch them because I can't stand like what I'm doing with my body or what I'm saying in between songs. Like I get so cringed out, but I, I don't believe there's a limit to improvement and growth. I do really think like, you know, the sky's the limit. Like you just keep going and you keep growing. You know, there's never being the best. There's always being better you know, with, with space and, and room to be human and, and make human mistakes. But, but yeah, I, I make an effort to improve on, you know, my performance, my vocals, and mainly the thing that I, I try really hard to be strict about improving and, and like making an effort in is my warm ups and cool downs and taking care of my voice and focusing on my, um, my technique vocally. I love that. Yeah, that's all important. How do you develop those practices? Do you get advice from other people or do they kind of happen naturally? It's it's happened naturally with advice, if that makes sense. It, it kind of, yeah. 
it was one of those things like I didn't ever see myself seeking it out, but I got the advice I needed from the right people at the right time. And I started using it. And for me, it's really important that I I'm strict with myself because I very easily will fall in and out of habits. If I'm not, you know, on top of it, if I'm not warming up every time, you know, before a show and, and doing my cool downs and things like that. And so just, I just keep it, you know, I, I try to keep a strict ritual, if that makes sense, you know, oh, yeah. having that moment before we play the set where I can be alone for maybe 10 to 15 minutes and do my warm ups, write my set list, you know, just get in the headspace and be ready to go. That's important. You, know, as you do the preparation work and it's going to be at least good every time. Yeah. You know, it's like if you prepare yourself enough that you are ready to handle whatever possible human error is going to exist. You know, you're in the right mindset. You know, for me personally, when I, when I step into the, maybe, you know, it's punk, there's not always a stage, but when I step (laughs) on the quote unquote stage, you know, I I enter this version of myself that is only present on stage with a microphone. And so when I know I've done my rituals and I feel like ready to step into that, that version of myself, it makes all the difference when things maybe don't go as planned. Right. But that's the thing. Like when you're on it, when you're prepared, even when things go wrong, yeah, you can still make it work. You're like, oh, okay, we'll just deal with that. You know, we've played like 150 shows this year. There's no Whoa. way every single show was perfect. And there's no way we went through all those shows without like one or two catastrophic moments, you know, where we're like, oh, crap, here we go. You know? <laughs> That's just how it is. Give us an example of a catastrophic (laughs) event that you successfully navigated. You know, oh man, this one is, (laughs) this one's (laughs) deep in scowl lore. We make a lot of jokes about this now, but I'll talk about it. Um, So we played an after show. It was a sold out after show, um, Sound and Fury weekend in LA. Um, I don't remember the venue, but it was a really cool show. It was a, flat spot records showcase the label we're on and i was really excited about it playing with bands i really like um regulate from new york speed they're from australia it it was just it was cool zulu our i love zulu but um it was a long weekend we had all kind of been partying things like that i felt prepared enough for the show though like i did not feel weird about it um malachi was very drunk. And <laughs> it was kind of one of those moments where nobody realized how much it, you know, how, how much he had to drink and until we were playing the set. Um, <laughs> and there were some moments where we all could, like looked at each other and we're like, oh my God, what's going on? You know what I mean? I think anyone who's ever played in a band knows that feeling when you look at someone else on stage, you do the eye contact for half a second and it's like, what's going on? But we managed to push through it. You know, he, he really crushed the set even like from, I think from an outsider point of view, like it really wasn't obvious, but we've just been on tour for so long and so dialed as like a punk band. Um, I say that lightly, but (laughs) we were so dialed. So like anything out of the ordinary was kind of scary. And that was a scary moment for sure. It felt emotional in the moment, but I, I knew what I had to do as like a, you know, a vocalist, a performer, the front person was just like, don't draw attention to it. Just keep doing the set. Like just throw all my energy into it. Throw all my energy into being cat and, you know, like being angry and fierce and whatever it is. But I did all that. And then at the end of the set, Malachi is just like, he's had enough. He's mad at his guitar. He breaks the guitar. (laughs) It was like the craziest rock star moment. And we, we make a lot of jokes about it now after we we've, figured out our limits, our boundaries. And we talked that over as a band and we got through that moment and it was literally fine. I think it's just when you're functioning as such a tight unit and you have something like that happen, it feels kind of like the death star is locked on you. And in the moment you're like, we're never going to come back from it. And realistically the next day, like nobody noticed, nobody remembers it except us. Yeah. I mean, everybody there to see you is there to see you and have a good time. And I think audiences are pretty forgiving unless you keep doing that every time. Absolutely. (laughs) I think we just, 
we were, we're such a, we were, we've had such a crazy busy year and it's taken a toll on us too. Like we're exhausted. We're mentally, emotionally exhausted and we're learning our boundaries as a band and as, as individuals on tour. And I think that was just a moment where like everything had added up and we were both celebrating, but like derailing at the same time. <laughs> and it was, it was very, uh, it, it kind of brought our little family closer though. It was very cool. That's good. It sounds like everybody realized what was going on and <laughs> talked about it. And it was like, cool. It wasn't like some bad conversation oh, no. and some, you know, like any weird stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. It totally felt dramatic in the moment. And now we joke about it as our, uh, our season two finale. <laughs> like that was really our, our season two finale. And that whole, that whole lead up, that whole tour was like three months straight of touring and traveling and exhaustion and, and drama. You know, we, we got our trailer stolen at one point on that tour and managed to get it back with everything in it. And how'd you do that? Oh man. Uh, we had air tags on everything. Yes. We had air tags on everything. So we got it back, but it, you know, we did not go down without a fight. We, we, I'll, I'll say that. We, so wait, <laughs> now, uh, maybe you can't reveal all details here, no. but did, did you find, you found out where it was yes. and got it back through means? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Mm, Everything was yes. taken care of. We, we got all our stuff, you know, all's well that ends well in Scal world. But that was definitely, that was like in the second quarter of a three month long tour. And then at the end of that whole tour, we end with the Sound of Fury after show. So you can understand now why it was a season finale. <laughs> wow. That Sound and Fury set looked insane. It was. It was There was so, so many nuts. people. That was definitely a peak moment for me. I, I could have cried after that set just of, of like happiness. I, I had no idea, no expectations with how that was going to go. And it exceeded anything I thought would happen. It was so nuts. and. I did not feel like I was the one who experienced that at all. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, when you're playing to a crowd that big, is it like it's got to be like an out of body experience, right? Absolutely, it's it's creepy. Like it's so weird because you're just like you kind of tune out that there's all these people with their lives and their thoughts and and perspectives, you know, staring at you. It's it's actually easier playing to that kind of crowd than it is playing like an intimate room. Yeah, yeah. I've had uh, people tell me that like after a certain number of people, you just don't really process it anymore. But if I was playing in a small room and I could see like my 10 friends individually standing in front of me, I'd be like, uh. Yeah, no, that scary nightmare. I'd be looking at each of their faces to gauge their enjoyment of the show. And if they were standing with their arms crossed, I'd be like, oh, no, they don't like it. It'd, it'd be a whole thing. Exactly. <laughs> So talk about the beginning of Scal. We're together, we're playing. What, do you get started playing in uh, Northern California? Yes. Our first show ever was at a venue called Sabrosa that it is this tiny room. It's a anarchist library. So it's it's like got a ton of scenes all over the place, books, all sorts of stuff. And it was awesome. It was a really cool first show. I had quite a few of my friends there. They were singing along. It was really cool actually very very positive moment and our first like two or three tours were mainly just california west coast and with you know friends from california it was really cool i th i would say looking back on it now with the perspective i do have now we we did not let up we we hit the ground running for sure wow so at your first show you've got people singing along yeah, that was a really lucky moment and, and like a really proud moment. I think if anything, I forgot some of my lyrics and I looked at my friends and they knew them and I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> okay, that's where we're at. It was it was really sweet. I love that. So, you know, you're a newer band. I guess you do it the same way, right? You get out there, you play shows, you get the attention of a label eventually, right? Yeah. So when does that happen? How do things start picking up? So over pandemic, uh, well, I, I'll, you know, reverse it a little. Our last tour before pan the pandemic uh, quarantine period happened, that tour ended the day that quarantine started. Ah. So we basically got in, did our, our the first full West Coast tour. We went from LA all the way up to Vancouver, BC. 
Um, and we did that tour with a really cool band called Punitive Damage. And the day we're driving home to Santa Cruz, everything starts shutting down. So there was kind of this moment of fear and like confusion that I, I everyone had. It's not just us, but we were kind of confused, like what's going on? Um, but we knew driving home from that tour, we were going to go home and start writing an album. So the pandemic did not halt any album plans. We were lucky to have a space and, and have a time to meet up with each other, you know, safely and write this album or write this record, How Flowers Grow. And um, so we wrote that record in April, May, June of 2020. And then in July of 2020, we recorded it with our friend Toshio, Charles Toshio, who records in, uh, he's from San Jose. So he's, he's a really cool guy. He's the homie. But um, we did the record in a week. And then from then we were kind of sitting on it and like, of course, going through mixes and all sorts of stuff. Um, and then we started to kind of shoot out feelers with labels and we couldn't decide if we even wanted to put the record out with a label we had never worked with a label before on our demo or our ep but you know we were there was interest for sure we we wanted to see what we could get and we submitted i think maybe we emailed flat spot i i don't remember exactly but we have some friends on flat spot already and they put in a good word for us and Flatspot was interested. And so we worked out a deal and put out the record in about a year ago. But the announcement that we were on Flatspot was, I think, in uh, made in like early 2021. Wow. So things must have started happening pretty quickly. Yes. <laughs> after that record came out, right? Yeah. Like kind of just the lead up, like the the singles, the rollout, all of that. We had never done that kind of thing before. And with Flat Spot, they just really took good care of us. We we got really lucky. I was like the week of the album's release, I had like a podcast or an interview every day. Like we were really <laughs> talking about this record. And it was really lucky and really cool. The timing was just amazing. And it all just kind of worked out perfectly. And it, it wasn't by design. I, it just, you know, we we got a lot of helping hands. And I don't know how. It was really cool. We're very, very lucky. Yeah, uh, you know, the label experience, I didn't experience it until this year, but you really get a lot of stuff done for you to the yes. point where I'm like, wait, really? Wow, okay. Yeah. You're like, wait, what? what's the catch, you know? <laughs> There's that thought, like, when, when's the other shoe going to drop, you know? But exactly. It's it's really cool. So how soon after the record comes out do all these big tours start <laughs> popping up? I mean, yeah. you've done uh, you've done a Limp Bizkit mm -hmm. arena tour. You've done the Glassjaw 20th anniversary tours. We've toured uh, Europe with One Step Closer and Touche Amore. I mean, you've done it all already at this point. We did a lot. We did so much. Um, we really grinded out this past year looking back like on support and like playing a lot of different crowds. And... I think it did so well for us and, and in a way that we had no expectations for. Like we we had really no idea what it would do for us. And and now it, looking back, it's it's done a lot of great stuff for us. We started this year, I, I actually remember towards the end of last year, we were on the tour with, uh, we did a Comeback Kid tour um, with No Warning in Zulu. And my friend Jeremy Bohm, who sings in Touche, Amore. He, he, he hit me up and he was like, Hey, do you want to hop on some of these dates? Are you guys open? And I was like, let me ask. We'll see. And that was for, I think February of, or, or March. I don't remember it. Remember exactly. But that was of 2022. So we already kind of had some stuff lined up. We did some, some shows with American nightmare in January lot this past year. And we just, things just started adding up. Things just started connecting. And so we did the Touche Amore tour and right before we left for that tour, we got the offer for uh, Limp Biscuit. So, and that tour began like a week after I would get home from Touche. So everything just kind of happened quick. And we had a tour with this band, Destroy Boys, which they're so cool. I love that band. The people in that band are just like, I can't, I can't say enough awesome things about them. And they have a really cool fan base. A lot of like 
young people who are, you know, young femme, queer kids and teenagers, like, and they're so excited and so devout and all so punk. It's awesome. So we, we did that and then immediately got on a plane and, and went to Europe and we had our first experience doing some, some of the fest circuit in Europe. And we also did some headliners and some support. And it was like, we covered all of our bases realistically. It just didn't stop. <laughs> yeah. That's gotta be like the dream come true, right? Yeah. You, you record this record, you're having an amazing reaction to it, and you're just being offered all these incredible tours with these incredible bands. I mean, you got to be pinching yourself yeah, still. Yeah, uh, 100%. I, I genuinely don't understand. And <laughs> like, and not in like a purposefully humble, like, oh, I don't get it. Like, no, I, I don't get it. I don't understand. <laughs> I, I don't, you know, and again, like not to, this isn't like, how do I say this? There's a lot of really good bands out there and Scowl is not reinventing the wheel. You know, we're a punk band. Um, we have gotten incredibly lucky. We've worked really, really hard, you know, not to say we haven't, but we've also gotten incredibly lucky. And I recognize how like important it is to show my, my gratuity and, and show like how grateful I am, you know, for for these opportunities and I don't I don't really know how it all happened. I definitely am pinching myself. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not too much of a surprise because the record is great how flowers grow and the band has a great look, a great sound. I mean, what's not to like? This is your time. <laughs> Thank you. I really yes. appreciate that. So, I got to ask about this uh arena tour with Limp Bizkit. Oh yeah. I'm curious, how how do they reach out? How do they get in touch with you? So this is kind of a story. Um, back in, I think, like, late, like maybe November last year, I think, or late fall. I, I'm trying to think. Um, Fred Durst DM'd the Scowl Instagram. on. Uh, I, I was hoping yeah. that was going to be it. Yeah. Amazing. He, yeah. <laughs> he just, like, DM'd us and said, hey, I love your band. And nice. every, I remember getting the screenshot or seeing it and being like, that's fake. <laughs> and that's totally fake. Nope, it's it was him. <laughs> like it was real. You know those memes where it's like a fake Michael Jackson will yes. e DM someone and be like, "Hey, I need money to record Thriller. Can you send it to me?" Like you probably exactly. thought it was that or something. No, exactly. I genuinely thought it was just like a silly little scam. <laughs> and you know, I'm tech savvy. I know better. But no, yeah. it was it was really Fred Durst, and he. I think so. Talking to him on the Limp Biscuit tour. We kind of asked him, like, how did you find out about us? Like, this is so random. Yeah. And he found us on TikTok, which is so nuts, like absolutely dystopian. But wow. it, it worked out that way. And he was just like, he fell in love, like immediately. He really liked us. I guess he went on YouTube and TikTok and everything, like immediately listened to everything we had, really fell in love with it. And when he DM'd us, he he kind of said loosely, like, would love to play some shows, like, you know, want a tour. But there wasn't really a date. And, and then so for a while, we were kind of like, oh, that's so cool. But nothing's going to come of it. You know, it's just we just got that stamp of approval. That's cool. And then we get a word to keep our like May, May month open and we're like, okay, you know, we're turning down tours for this hopeful Limp Biscuit tour. And it was like kind of soul crushing for a moment because I thought like it's just never going to happen. And then right before the Touche Amore tour began, I was set to be like, I was at work and like the, my next day was going to be my last day working for a month because I was going to go on tour. We get the Limp Biscuit offer. I look at how the timing's all going to work out and I realize like I'm going to be on tour for three months. There's no point like keeping this job right now. So I literally went upstairs to my boss and I was like, I'm quitting. Um, <laughs> and, what kind of job was it? Um, I worked for a coffee roastery, um, Verve Coffee in Santa Cruz. They're, they're awesome. Great company. Did you quit like that day or did you give notice? I, I quit like they knew I was leaving for a month, but I was leaving and not coming back at that after with a day's notice, but they were really, they were really cool about it. Actually, like I, a lot cooler than I would expect most places to be, but I worked very hard. You know, I, 
I did a good job, I think, hopefully. <laughs> um, and they really liked me and they were really proud of me and really happy for me. They had kind of picked up that, you know, my my band and my music was really important to me and that it kind of came first in certain ways, you know? Of course, paying bills is really important, but when you're in your early 20s and you're in a punk band, you, you want to do that instead. So they were really, really supportive and really proud of me. So you're, you get the Limp Bizkit tour. I mean, your, your heads must be exploding at this oh, yeah. point. Oh yeah. That, that was one of my favorite bands when I was younger. <laughs> like I, I got, that was like my first taste of heavier music. Yeah. The alternative boom happened and then new, me- like Corn and Limp Bizkit were coming out and it was like this, this eerie, like underground music. Yeah. And then, uh, like quickly after that, I discovered hardcore and then, well, the rest you know. is history. Exactly. But I mean, talk about that first show. Oh, on this tour. I, I, I got to hear about that. I was losing my mind. Um, <laughs> Where was it? It was in Florida. <laughs> um, oh, my God. I, I don't remember. It. I think it was Tampa. I think it was yeah. Tampa. And it was at a Hard Rock Hotel casino. And just pulling up, you know, it's not like you pull up to a DIY venue and you know where everything is. Like it was a freaking maze. Like I didn't know, <laughs> we didn't know anything. We didn't know where to go. We, we had no information. We were genuinely like, are we supposed to be here? You know? <laughs> and then we park, we start, you know, we're kind of getting out. We're meeting other, the other support bands like Wargasm from the UK. They're really cool. And those are our good friends now, but you know, meeting them for the first time, it's like, who are these people? What are we doing here? Um, you know, who did we convince to be here? Cause something's <laughs> wrong. Um, and then we pull up and we get inside the venue. We see everything. Limp Biscuits literally sound checking. And I'm just like, Oh my God, my, my heart is falling out of my butt. Like I could not <laughs> believe what was happening. And I kind of had a moment where I was like, am I meant to do this? Like, can I really do this? Yeah. Um, and then we met Fred Durst and he was so nice and so cool. And kind of got a feel for him and and everyone. And that night we played the set and had a really cool reaction considering the crowd was mainly people who had never, ever heard of us. And it it was honestly really cool. And then um, I remember watching Limp Bizkit side stage and, you know, they played uh, Break Stuff last and they invited everyone, like all the bands, all the support, like on stage. And we just all like sang it and dance and I was a little drunk and it was, it was a really cool moment. It was very, <laughs> very cool. I was like, wow, I'm doing this. Like, this is nuts. Um, Incredible. Yeah. Really, really cool. Once in a lifetime experience. Like that whole tour was just really special. And um, it felt cool to be, to also be pampered on tour. Like we had like really nice green rooms and like a whole so much food there was catering do you get your own groom i me myself or like a scowl i should say um we did on that tour we 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 for the most part we did because the venues were huge they had so much and then sometimes we would share with like some of the other support bands which wasn't a problem because we all got along and had a lot of fun partying with each other and scowl just makes friends everywhere we go so we really don't have have a hard time with that (laughs) that's good How's, what's the food situation on a tour like that? I imagine oh like those God. metal trays with those heater cups and there's yes. like real food and stuff. Yes, it, yes, yes, exactly. It, yes. It's honestly really cool because on tour, usually you eat like crap. And this was so nice because it was like, I can make a sandwich. There's vegan options. You know, there's, I'm really getting every food group. I can have a green juice and a soup and a salad and just everything. It was really, really cool. I... I wish everyone could have that experience. Like it, it was, it was hard to go on to other tours and like play other shows after that. Cause I was like <laughs> so spoiled for a second. What if you just like tried to start writing that into your rider? That's the hope, you know, the hope <laughs> is that scowl becomes, nah, I, who knows the, the hope, the, the hopes and dreams are that one day we can just, you know, snap our fingers and, and somebody's, massaging our feet and bringing us feeding us grapes on a platter yeah that's that's always the dream <laughs> that's you know? that's the punk dream you know exactly and i always think like oh no i do everything myself but like i've ordered every meal to be delivered <laughs> to my house s- since last year oh my gosh yeah exactly like you know, every meal there's nothing wrong with appreciating a little bit of you know convenience and, and 
if if you're if you're able to you know invest in yourself that way it, it goes a long way but realistically on tour like to be entirely realistic like i don't expect anything and i've learned to take care of myself oh like in an okay way you know i've learned i've learned the bare minimum and I, i'm only learning more and as we go there's that hope that maybe we can fit certain things in the budget to be a little bit more comfortable but we're still sleeping on floors it all depends on uh, the tour, basically, and just yeah. what's going on with the band. You know exactly, exactly. So you have great style and aesthetics, Kat. Thank I, you. I see pictures of the band, and they always stick in my mind. Talk about the evolution of that. Like, how did you develop yeah. your style and your taste, and and just piece everything together? You know, I you're asking the the questions I like. I love talking about this. Um, I just, I really like fashion. I've always like been a fan. Um, there was a long time when I was a kid when I was very devout to being not girly, not wearing pink, not wearing dresses, not wearing skirts. Like I was a tomboy. And then something kind of changed. I found out about eyeliner in middle school and I got really into like, you know, being like an, a little emo scene kid and was really obsessed with that. And that, that kind of bloomed this like love for, you know, styling myself with the things that I like. So maybe not necessarily fashion yet, but just like, oh, I like purple skinny jeans. I like Vans. I like eyeliner. I like colored hair, whatever it is. And, you know, expressing myself through that. And throughout my teen years, I just, I got really into that. I was on Tumblr a lot, you know, Pinterest and really, really interested in aesthetics and, and, you know, having a vision and I loved art. I always loved art. So that kind of played into it as well. And, and also falling in love with like, you know, artists from the time that were really popular, like Lana Del Rey, who is heavily influenced by aesthetics, you know, like a lot of what she does is, is very conceptually driven and, and visually driven. So with Lana Del Rey, I, I've actually, I don't think I've ever heard more than one song and yeah. I really don't know anything about her <laughs> except that like some people really love her and some people are mad at her for reasons yeah. I don't even understand. But I, I look at pictures of her and like albums al and mm -hmm. album covers and I, 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 I'm drawn to them. I stare at oh, them yeah. um, because like this, the style is mm -hmm. so good. Yeah. And that's exactly the point. Like I, I've gotten to this point now. I've grown into this person who who really enjoys creating a a vision, you know, with my fashion and and even just like something simple like the way I do my hair or my makeup. Like I really enjoy that and that's art for me and I love doing art and so it, it was really valuable to me and then getting into hardcore, of course hardcore is really about, you know, dark hard imagery and and starting a band, I wanted to lean into something that felt more authentic. So Scal ended up with bright colors and flowers. And I liked that stuff. And that was what I was feeling. So we leaned into that. And now that's kind of like our MO. And it feels really cool because I'm recognizing now that people are relating to it. A lot of young femme people are specifically. And that makes me feel really good because it, it means like, you know, I, I think about it from the perspective of of being like a young girl and, and and seeing that and resonating with it and how powerful that is. So I'm I'm really grateful to have even the opportunity to do that. But at the base of it, it's just stuff I like. And I think that I, I appreciate my, my past self for valuing that. Yeah, it's something I got into on accident over time. You know, I used to wear like cargo shorts and mm -hmm. XL t-shirts. And then <laughs> someone's like, hey, you know, like you could wear like a nice pair of jeans. And I'm like, Wait, oh. what? Yeah, like and record then, scratch. Yeah, and then you discover like high fashion stuff. Mm -hmm. or And then there's all the trends over the years, like Vans and the uh, picnic table shirts that you would yes. buy from Urban Outfitters. And I've, I've gone through all that. Now I just wear all black, but it's really <laughs> high fashion black. So nice. you know, I, I progress I'm, to that. I love that vibe. I love that yeah. so much. I I totally know what you mean. Yeah. And and specifically with Scowl, when we started, I wasn't wearing, you know, the stuff I'm wearing now. I was really, really shy of that. I was scared and I wanted to kind of like fit in with the like, you know, Dickies and and um Air Maxes, you know, like band shirt kind of vibe. And I did it my own way. But as time went on, I I 
really like Debbie Harry and the runaways and, and the cramps and things. And I was like, I want to wear go-go boots on stage. Like I want to wear dresses. I want to make, do my hair really big. And I just kind of full send did it. And I'm lucky now, like some people kind of fuck with it, you know, (laughs) some people (laughs) like it, but some people don't. And that's okay. Everyone's entitled to their own, like, you know, opinions and tastes, but well, if they don't like it, they have bad taste. And <laughs> that's my opinion. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, because when you listen to the record, mm-hmm. it's like super aggressive. And I picture like bullet belts and like yeah. shaved heads and 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 all black. And that stuff's cool. But th- the reason I like scowl and the look and everything is because of the contrast you're talking about. Yeah. Like there there is some of that stuff, but it's not just that. And kind of the floral patterns that I see on the record and everything that the, the contrast I think makes it more special. Thank you. Yeah. And that was all purposeful. It was just like liking doing what I liked, doing what felt good and what felt right with the imagery. And, and it's funny too, because funny you say that there was a time in my life when I would wear my hair in Liberty spikes, you know, there was, there was a time like that before I started wearing go-go boots and dresses on stage. So it, there really is like a corner for everyone and everyone's little identity. I hope on, on like, you know, how flowers grow and with, with scowls music, that's the, at least the effort put in is that that space is created for anyone. Yeah. And that's good that you had the courage to just do what you want to do. I mean, for so long, I guess not in terms of clothing, cause I did always kind of wear different stuff and there was a lot of trial and error. And mm-hmm. now I'm just like, whatever, I'm going to wear whatever I want. And that's the way it's going to go. But to, you know, to have the courage to try the different things and evolve with your taste, that's a great thing. Absolutely. And I, and I recommend that experience for everyone because it's so euphoric and it's, it's such a special experience. It really is. I have to say, there's a lot of natural highs out there releasing a great song, uh, mm-hmm. having a great conversation on a podcast, <laughs> uh, pairing the perfect video with the perfect song. Those all hit right. But when you buy like a really good piece of clothing oh, and you put it yes. on and you're out there and you can, and you see people on the street, like quickly glancing at you, yep. ooh, it's the best. When, when, a, when I'm out and I, I know my hair is done, my makeup's done, I'm in an outfit and a girl tells me, I love your outfit or I love your makeup. Like it, I could, I, I will sleep peacefully that night. I'm <laughs> so happy. Like that's all I want is that validation, you know, like, girl, you see me, I see you too. Like, uh, it feels so special. And it, it's, it feels really like surface level to say, but it does mean something to me. You know, it's something I value. If you value it, then it's important. And you know what I do too. I I had to go (laughs) see a client, uh, Tuesday and I had my, my long, uh, more business jacket on. It's like this tweed, cool looking jacket. And I walk in and the greeter's like, Oh, sir, right this way. By the way, great jacket. And yeah. I was like, yes. Yeah, it's like that little moment. Like, yes. Okay, cool. And, and you walk with a little bit more pep in your step. You know, it gives you that confidence. Exactly. So let's talk about what we have coming up. I mean, mm-hmm. you've, got a, you've got a tour coming up with Show Me the Body, correct? Yes, I'm so excited for that. That kicks off February 9th. In, oh, in Philadelphia, Union yeah. Transfer, my home city. Excellent. I love Philly. We actually played Philly for the first time just this recent, I think it was in October or early November. I am so terrible with dates, but it was our first time playing Philly and it was so cool. It popped off. I cannot wait to go back. I saw some of that footage and yeah. it was great. The The crowd was going wild. Philly is a unbelievably great music city. That's where I cut my yep. teeth and, and discovered the scene. And there's just so many amazing bands that come from there. It's, it's great. Absolutely. So uh, you've got that tour coming up. What else do we have coming up? What else can we talk about? Yeah, we. so we've got quite a bit. I mean, we're it, there's stuff still in the works to be announced, things like that. Um, we're playing some shows on the West Coast with um, Circle Jerks right at the end of the year to close it out. And I'm really excited. Um, yes, and you know, I heard another interview with you and uh, you know in your evolution of music and discovering all different types of music you discovered like the classic punk rock oh yeah 
And the guy from the Circle Jerks really likes your band, right? Yeah, Keith Morris. He's yeah, he's cool. I I got the pleasure to meet him and actually do an interview with him for um, Trust Records One Two Me You, um, and in promotion for them reissuing Group Sex, I think, or it might have been Wild in the Streets. I I have terrible memory, so bear with me. But it was really cool. It was a trip and a half. I felt so freaked out. I had never interviewed anyone. And I was about to sit down with Keith Morris, who is just a pistol. He has such a hilarious character. Um, But it was really cool meeting him and just kind of like, you know, I felt like I was like talking directly to the horse's mouth. You know, this is someone who's a grandfather to everything that I've built what my life as I know it on, you know, and it was a really special experience. And he really likes scowl. He told me some, some stuff that really went to my head that I I really appreciated hearing. You know, he, he recognized how we, we keep things short and punk and we cut out the fat and, and that was really special because that that's always been intentional. Um, and it, it was just really cool. The whole thing was really fun and really cool. Keith Morris is the guy. He's awesome. But yeah, like just that alone, now we get to play some gigs with them. Like I cannot believe that's even happening. Like that is so crazy. Liberty Spike Cat is definitely freaking out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, And then we also have a show, a headliner, our first headliner in LA um, on December 10th at the Roxy. And I'm really excited, really nervous. I want to sell this thing out. Like I really hope it pops off. And if it doesn't, that's okay. We've got like some really cool bands opening that will definitely have people out to see them. Um, Spy, also from the Bay, um, Primitive Blast, and this really cool band called Jinx. Um, so that's really cool. We've got we've got a lot of cool gigs coming, but underneath all that, we're also we're working on new music. We have some new music that's ready to go that's going to start getting released early next year and I could not be more excited I'm so ready to play these songs um and I I really hope people like them I think this is without sharing too much but this is the first time you know we've recorded music and I I genuinely felt like wow like like I I did a good job like Kat did a good job like I I don't have a ton of musical experience so I've always been kind of hard on myself and this is the first time that I'm feeling like pretty confident in my abilities and I'm really really excited about it. I love that. That's awesome. So for it, for your previous releases and how flowers grow yes. were you still super critical of yourself and and just maybe thinking that you weren't nailing it or something? Like what were you feeling? Um half of it is I wasn't nailing it for sure. It's not even like I think it was definitely partially just me, you know, being inexperienced, not knowing what's going on, not having matured strong vocals and you know, not loving my lyrics or whatever it may be. And of course, the other half is, you know, the classic artist brain where you're just so hard on yourself and so like embarrassed and ashamed and cringed out by everything you do. But <laughs> but music is inherently vulnerable and you have to accept that and lean into it a little bit without being too corny. And I've learned how to do that. I've learned to appreciate everything I've done in the past and not be so hard on myself and just just appreciate that it's, I've grown, you know, I've matured. Yeah. And that's great advice for any artist. And I've talked about it on this show before. You just have to embrace being bad. Exactly. Every time now I'm in a position so that I'm so grateful to be in, uh, where like younger people will come up to me, usually femmes, like girls will come up to me at a show and tell me like they want to start a band and they ask me how I did it. And, you know, maybe sometimes they're going to ask her advice. And my number one piece of advice now looking back is you don't have to love your demo. You don't have to love your first band. You just got to do it. Just get in there, get in that practice space, write those songs, record with your friend in their garage, whatever it is, get it out, play a show. You don't have to love it. It doesn't have to be perfect. Just do it because just that alone is proving to yourself that you can do it. That's great advice. That's really all it takes. Because for me, in the past, I used to be like, oh, I use, I have to have this equipment. I have to have these mm-hmm. people. I have to do this before I start the thing. No, yeah. just start doing it, whatever it is. And yep. 
that's what you did as well. I mean, you you just got out there, you picked <laughs> up the microphone, you started doing the vocals, you're playing in the band, you started doing this thing just like anyone else. And look, you're quote unquote being bad the first years of this band, the first record. Mm-hmm. I mean, look, look at everything you're doing. Yeah. I'm I'm so like I try I, I want to give myself credit, but I'm so scared of embracing like <laughs> pride, you know, surrounding yeah. being a musician because I've only recently accepted that like I can call myself a musician. Yeah. You know, like I was like, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but now I'm like, you know what? I have an idea. I have a, I have like a blind idea of what I'm doing. So you know what? I, I'm kind of a musician. You're a you're a musician. You can call yourself a <laughs> yeah. musician for sure. Thank you. Yes, you you have that right. And listen, I love promoting myself. If I'm not going to do it, who else is going to? <laughs> I am. I embrace it now. Yeah, totally. So you've got the tour with Show Me the Body. You've got a tour with Circle Jerks. We've got new music coming. Right. Talk about yeah. some of your creative process. How does it work? Does the band bring music to you? Do you work together? Do you ever write riffs? Like, how does it work? Yeah, um, it's very collective for the most part. Malachi, he plays guitar. He, he'll he come to the group with kind of a, a really bare skeleton of, you know, of a song. He's good at writing songs. He's, he's great at that. He only picked up a guitar when Scal started. So he still is like very punk, very elementary with his guitar playing. But it it adds into the essence that is Scowl. But he's really good at putting together a song. And we'll kind of maybe pick or choose parts that we like or don't like or rearrange it. And Bailey, who plays bass, is is really talented at bass and, and kind of writing. It's really fun, like little bass licks. If you haven't noticed, Scowl is very bass driven. So Bailey brings a lot to the table. And then Cole will usually, who drums, he he kind of comes up with his own stuff, kind of comes up with his own fills. And then for me, it's just like I take whatever the song structure is and and I'll um, come up with lyrics and come up with a flow or melodies or whatever it is. And sometimes we'll kind of sit and rearrange and maybe argue with each other for a little while on something. <laughs> and then, you know, by the time you record it, it's completely different than it ever was. But that's a good thing because you know, compromise is really important in that space. Um, but yeah, we, we do it pretty collectively. We all kind of come together. Malachi just has an idea and we run with it. And I really like that. I would love to experience what it's like to write my own music, like write, you know, learn to play guitar, learn keys and kind of write a song like that. But I'm getting there, you know, I'm dabbling. Yeah. Yeah, all all in due time. These things yeah. just happen when they're supposed to. Absolutely. I one thing though I love doing is I love writing poetry. I love writing r- lyrics. I love like coming up with new ways to get my point across, but also, you know, do something that say something catchy, say something in a way that scratches my brain in a in a different way that I haven't experienced before. So, I I'm really enjoying that aspect. Like if anything being a musician is so cool because of the creative aspect. And I just want more time to do that. Do you, are you always writing? Like, are you always writing at some point during the week and then you have stuff to pick from when it's time to put together a song? Um, I wouldn't say it's like a scheduled thing, but I'm definitely writing lyrics in my notes app constantly. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like a daily thing if I get an idea or if I get an idea for like a vocal melody or, or like a, you know, like a chorus, like vocally, like I'll have to record that immediately. If I'm driving on the freeway, I I open up my voice memo and, and I have to sing that into my phone just so it's there. So it's pretty regular. And then Malachi's the same way I live with him. So he sits on the couch almost every day and, and plays on the guitar and just comes up with new stuff. It does not stop. So you said you and Malachi really just started playing and performing with this band? Um, Malachi had played in a couple bands before Scowl. So he had, he had quite a bit of experience just like doing the punk thing and, you know, playing DIY shows. And he played bass in a band before Scowl, a band called Jawstruck. They're really good. They're from Santa Cruz, San Jose. And then he had fronted a band even before that. And he's right now he fronts two bands and He's always trying to start something new. He's so busy. He's 
awfully busy, but he's always, <laughs> he's always trying to do something new. And then Cole who plays drums, he had also been in quite a few bands and played in bands with Malachi. So they had that kind of chemistry to write together. Um, and Bailey who plays bass also plays in a handful of other bands has played in bands for years. So I'm, I'm realistically kind of the baby with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you're doing great. So keep it up. They, they carry me for sure. Now that Scowl is blowing up and everybody wants to tour with you, are are any producers seeking you out to do like a, an electronic solo album or is anybody else trying to poach you for other bands? I hope. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I, I genuinely, we're definitely, we get hit up for things that yeah. are weird, crazy, wacky things. I got asked earlier this year to narrate a documentary about which was so cool and i it's not out yet so i'll be able to promote it more when it's out and accessible but it's called cover your ears and it has been announced so i'm not i'm not oversharing but it's really cool it's called cover your ears and it's um it's really good it's a really cool documentary it's about music censorship and just that opportunity alone was like so crazy like i would have never imagined narrating a documentary so Long story short, weird stuff comes up, weird offers, really cool, unique things. Um, and I just want to do more of that because I think it's really fun. And and it's it's something to do that like I would have never expected to have the opportunity to do. So That's amazing. What's a really weird offer that you got that you clearly did not want to do? Um, oh, man, I got to think about this one. Oh, I can't say. I really can't say. I can't, <laughs> there, like, I feel my guilty conscience is too high. But there's definitely been things in the past that I've kind of like politely declined. It's hard to say no. It's yeah. really hard to say no, especially when, you know, we kind of started out this year with like the starvation mindset, I realized, where we didn't say no to anything. And now we're getting to a point where we're like, we kind of have to say no sometimes. And it's okay. It's okay not to do everything. It's actually better not to do everything. But there was a moment for sure when it was like everything always. And I don't know what I've said no to at this point, to be honest. Like I've done some weird stuff. If anything, I just say no to the weird ones where it's like in person, random random person comes up to me on a show and, and asks for something that's like out of my boundaries. And I'm like, no, sorry. <laughs> like... I, I think yeah. someone someone asked me, this is like not the same, but someone asked me to choke them in a picture, Whoa. which was really interesting. It was in, in London. Someone said, yeah, like, can you put your hand around my neck? Like, choke me. Yeah. Like, like the song Choke. And I was like, okay, <laughs> um, word, we'll get the picture, you know? <laughs> but yeah. that was, that was super odd. <laughs> That is that is weird. Well, I mean, uh, I guess it, the song's called Choke, right? I guess so. Yeah. It works. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have like a manager now or someone you can like have say no for you? Yes. Oh, and that's got to be great, right? It is so great. I am so lucky. I have that now. It's we call them in Scowl world because um, we kind of have our own dictionary. We call them our business bodyguards. You know, they're the people that can argue and, and ask for more or tell people to back off for us because we're too, too nice and, and too shy. That's perfect. Yeah, I, I'm racked with things. I have a really hard time saying no. Absolutely. Uh, oh, and if anyone's listening to this, don't ask me for anything. But yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll get an email and I, I don't want to say no right away. So I, exactly. I, I, I have all this anxiety. And then f like after a week or two, I'll, I'll build up enough confidence to reply and be like, sorry, not right now or whatever I have to say. Exactly. Yeah. It's not fun. It's, it's a hard position to be in and I don't like it. And that's why I have my business bodyguards who babysit me and it's really, really nice. I'm very lucky. <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, is there anything coming up we didn't mention that we would like to mention in the end here. We clearly have a ton of shows coming up. We've got tours. We've got some unannounced stuff. We're working out um, really cool stuff. I'm really excited about. And the new music mainly is like the, I really hope people like it. I, I hope people go out of their way to listen to it and, and appreciate it the way I do. So yeah, I'm excited. Awesome. Well, Kat, I just want to say thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to 
come on the show and talk to us. And, you know, you and the band are doing amazing things. So just keep doing what you're doing. And I'm looking forward to more. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate you having me and letting me blab about it. So. And there you have it, Kat Moss. What a great conversation. Just great energy from her. And I'm just so happy that things are going well for the band. You know, they got out there, they grinded, they're playing shows just like everybody else. The hardcore world or the scene or whatever you want to call it is having a huge reaction to where flowers grow. And I mean, some pretty incredible stories like Greg, uh, Fred Durst hitting them up on Instagram. Yeah, that's insane. That's every every band's dream, I think. Yeah. And the, the fact, that, well, one, the fact that he hit them up on Instagram is great. And the fact that he discovered them on TikTok is also great. I haven't delved into the TikTok world yet, other than just getting lost on, I guess, TikTok through Instagram. But um, yeah, I guess that seems to be the next way that a lot of bands are uh, getting acknowledged. I don't know how I feel about it, but uh I'm I'm open to seeing what what it leads to, I guess. Yeah, I mean if it's working for people, great. I don't use TikTok for music. I post there, I make stuff, but I I just feel really dumb when I'm flipping through TikToks all, or Instagram Reels, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it's just these 20 seconds 20 second videos of nothing and I'm like, "What am I doing?" Uh, and I put the phone down, but I don't know. I just use TikTok to post my own stuff or I look at Warzone stuff, the game sometimes. That That's it. But um, yeah, really great conversation with Kat. I'm glad that uh, she's doing well. The band is doing well. The record's doing fantastic. They've got no shortage of amazing tours coming up. There's one with Show Me the Body. They got something in Europe coming up, I think, with uh, One Step Closer and some other band. They're, they're playing with it. They're, they've played with everybody and they're playing with everybody already amazing yeah i i think they're coming to the east coast in february and i think uh i'll actually be flying out to the west coast in february so i'm hoping i get to catch them that when i think i saw that they're playing richmond i don't remember the date off the top of my head but i'm hoping so and uh it'd be really cool to see them Uh, i checked out a couple videos on youtube and, and it seems just that uh you know like she was saying she can really she's not familiar or wasn't familiar with uh, ever doing vocals before in a band, and she clearly seems to uh, know how to control the crowd in a good way and and keep the energy going the entire show, and it's it's awesome. It was really cool to see, at least on YouTube. I'm hoping to catch it live. I like how she said she didn't know what she was doing at first, and she wouldn't even face the crowd, and she had to learn just how to control her voice and command the crowd and all that stuff. I think some people learn faster than others, you know? Sometimes people do it for, I don't know, five years more until they really nail it. Seems like she's getting a a hold of things pretty quickly, which is great. So yeah, really awesome. Very happy that I had the opportunity to speak with Kat. Kat, thank you again for coming on the show. Awesome. Awesome stuff. So Greg, now let's talk about our favorite subject. (laughs) Us. 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 (laughs) I want to hear from you, Greg. How are we doing? How are we doing? Let's start with you. Now, we talked a little bit about Shiloh in the beginning of the show. You're based out of Richmond, Virginia. The band's based out of Richmond. We're actually, uh, sorry. Um, I mean, originally, yes, we're from Richmond, but, uh, as the lineup, current lineup is, uh, we're actually based out of California, Richmond, Virginia, and Rhode Island, Providence. No. Yeah. So makes practicing a little difficult, but we're, we're making it work. So yeah. The band formed out of the ashes of Vessel, you said? Yeah, just just a post metal van or band with vocals and uh yeah, similar sound, uh a little bit darker, I guess. Uh the vocals were kind of like throatier verse vocals. Uh that band Verse from a while ago. Yeah, that's what we were hoping to sound like, but yeah, it 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 was just fun. We were, we were I was 18 years old and we were just you know, trying to start a band that didn't sound like other Richmond bands at the time. And, and that's what was coming out. So it was, it was fun. How did you make the choice to go vocalless? 
Um, we were writing softer stuff at the time, and our vocalist at the uh, Tristan at the time was was kind of ready to uh, pursue other things in his life, and just yeah. So it it was an equal like equal parting of of ways, and yeah. So it worked out worked out nicely. I still see Tristan and talk to him from time to time, but yeah, not so not so much anymore. You know, I am a huge post rock fan. I'm just going to call it all post rock. I don't like to say post rock, post metal, whatever. I listen to it all, and you know that's why I really like your band. And I, you know, I'm I'm so into post rock. Sometimes I would listen to a new band, and it would sound very post rock, and I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. And then I would hear vocals, and I'd be like, ew, and turn it off. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> I yeah. think most people have the opposite effect, but for me, like sometimes vocals can actually turn me off. Mm-hmm. I, I can I can believe it. Yeah, I mean. I still want to see what it would sound like to uh, maybe collaborate with somebody uh, to do vocals on a song. We, when we were in Europe, we had uh, a band that we were on tour with called Divided. Uh, their vocalist came out uh, for one of our shows tour or one of our uh, songs towards the end of our tour, and he did vocals and we recorded it. I don't know if it'll get released, um, but it was fun. It was just nice to have somebody kind of fronting us for a show again and, and stuff like that yeah it's 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 awesome to do it sometimes like uh hammock has vocals sometimes yeah uh, i know caspian will have a song every now and again with vocals they mix it in mogwai does the same thing i like uh the the pinch of vocals sometimes. Yeah, exactly yeah yeah that's mm-hmm. the way to do it you yeah wasn't that a european tour you just did recently yeah that was um oh man uh october all of october Yep. How was that? It was, I don't want to say rough. It, <laughs> um, the past two tours that we've done previously were really good. And I think we went over there. This was uh, pre pandemic. And we went over there with the mindset that it was going to be the same way this year. And uh, I think that, you know, it was just a, we played in new markets each day. And uh, every single drive was, you know, minimum between six and eight hours. So. Over there, you load in at 2 or 3 or 4 p.m., and then the show doesn't start till 9 or 10. And we were the headlining band each night. So, yeah, it was, it was just different for us. But, yeah, I mean, little sleep and eating gas station food. But, of course, gas station food over there is still, you know, a thousand times better than it is here. Um, So you're still eating decent, but it's it's not like, you know, substantial meals. And then, yeah, just little sleep and then getting in the road or getting on the road and doing it again. So, but we saw some really cool places and met a r- lot of really, really cool, awesome people. I love that. How was the uh, reception to your band over there? I feel like Europeans would be more receptive to that sound. Cause you know, sometimes in America people are like, Oh no vocals. Uh, and I'm like, dude, come on, grow up. Yep. Um, yeah. I mean, overall it's, it's always been really positive over there. Um, I think that's probably why we try to get over there as much as we can. Unfortunately, plane tickets are still uh, we're coming out of pocket and and funding all of it, so it's it's difficult. But um, yeah, overall, we we really enjoyed over there, and everyone's super supportive. Um, I remember our first tour over there. We got to the venue, and they were like, "Oh yeah, we have catering for you. Oh, we have this," and it's like, "Whoa!" And then we're playing last and we're like, well, we've never played here before. We're not used to this in the States. Are people going to stick around? And yeah, I mean, even more people showed up and it's like, this is cool. You've never heard of us, but you're completely like, you know, engaged with us. You're not on your phones and you're just, you're just out enjoying yourselves. And you come up and talk to us afterwards. You maybe buy some merch either way. It's, it's all super appreciative and it's, it's really cool to I don't know go be so far from home, but also feel so like welcome. I love that. Yeah. So wait a second, uh, Ryan of Holy Fawn remixed one of your songs. Yeah, he he's done two songs, I think. Um, Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> they're like one of my all time favorite bands. That must have been a great thing to collaborate with him, right? Yeah, it was really cool. Um, Ryan and I have talked for. Uh, couple years i guess and i didn't know that he even knew about us and then uh i guess before they released uh was death spells yep 
and they um yeah he, he talked and i was like man it'd be really cool to play some shows together sometime and yeah so one thing led to another and he was like hey i'm doing some remixes uh i was like here take this song take this song let's do it and uh yeah i think he he adds a really interesting uh twist to the songs and it was really cool to have his his mindset on it yeah he's a pure talent and i hear that he's a gamer too so i really respect that (laughs) there you go yeah yeah (laughs) so what have you got coming up i mean uh you know is there some new music coming or is there more tours what can we look forward to yeah um a little bit of both um we have an ep that we are we don't have a set uh release date yet we're working on artwork right now so that'll be out I'm thinking early next year sometime. I don't exactly know when. And then we're writing a full length right now. Um, as I said, we're spread out uh, across the U.S. right now. So uh, between our personal lives and schedules, it, it becomes a little difficult to get in the same room. Um, so we're trying, you know, writing remotely. We just started using a new uh, program, Blinking. I'm blinking the name on it right now. But uh yeah, we we've been using it and uh so far it's it's going decently well. Some some we try to do weekly sessions and uh weekly phone calls at least and uh some some days go better than others, but yeah, I mean overall it's it's coming together and we just try to get in the room whenever we can, usually before a tour or before a big show in Richmond or something like that. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm happy you guys can do that considering everybody lives so far away. I mean, my band all lives in New York City and I can barely hold it all together. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it obviously would be easier if we we're all in the same city or whatever, but as we've gotten older, we've kind of we're we're realizing we can still make it work and uh I think the five of us are very devoted to wanting to play music together and and just, you know, pushing the band as much as we can. I did forget to mention we have uh, three festivals that we've announced in Europe next year. Let's see. One is uh, at the beginning in Copenhagen. We were scheduled to play it this past year called Colossal Weekend. Uh, the Yeah, Colossal Weekend. And we we're scheduled to play it this past May. Um, unfortunately, some uh, family life circumstances happened. We had to cancel the tour. Um, so we're going back next year. We're really excited about it. And then uh, at the end of May, we're playing in uh, the UK for the first time. And that's really cool because that's with. And so, so I watched you from afar. But it's a, it's a wild lineup and we're super excited for it. Amazing. And so I watch you. They're awesome, too. I love that band. Yep. Greg, I actually met you at Furnace Fest. Yes. 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 And you were wearing a new scene shirt, which <laughs> I love. They're great shirts. If I remember correctly, Casey told me that you tour manage for Slow Crush. Uh, yeah, I'd say tour manage loosely because I've never yeah. done it before up until um we played with them earlier in the year, and um I guess I forget exactly when it was earlier this year, but uh they stayed with me, and then uh, later on they contacted me and they were like, "Hey, do you want to do some driving and for like our next?" tour and some tour manage and and merch and stuff i was like yeah i can do that sure what's you know what's uh what does it involve and and it's like all right let me google tour managing and i was like (laughs) i mean i i've done this on and off i still hate talking to uh you know promoters about financial stuff but we're i'm getting over it but yeah uh no overall it was it was great i i love slow crush they are amazing humans um they're the sweetest people ever and uh yeah, I'll be actually joining them again in, on the West Coast in February. So I'm really excited about that. That's awesome. I love that band. And their set at Furnace Fest this past year was one of the most memorable sets I've ever seen. Oh, absolutely. I think the uh, sun setting in the background was was pretty perfect. So That's what made it perfect. Yep. <laughs> I loved it. And then I saw Elliot, I think, the day before, and they also played at Sunset. Yep. And it, uh, there's just something about seeing the band at Sunset that's the best. Yeah, absolutely. That was fun. So, Greg, let's let's hear about how you are doing personally outside of the band. How's your life? How are you? What do you like to do when you're not writing and recording and touring and tour managing? Yeah. Um. I, well, I'm getting over the flu. 
Uh, oh, that's right. Wait, first, let me say, yes, you had the flu or have the flu, possibly still have it. So number one, are you feeling better? And number two, thank you so much for coming on the show, despite uh, <laughs> getting over being sick. Totally, totally fine. No, I'm, I'm, uh, I think 95% there. Um, I'm still a little nasally congested, but uh, overall, I'm feeling significantly better. Um, it was, it was weird. Uh, I don't think I've gotten body aches and chills and uh i had 102 fever at one point and Whoa. yeah so it was, it was a little scary but um yeah and i was like man i feel like this is covid but it's also the same symptoms um but i tested negative three different times uh for covid and i i was fine so yeah but i like to uh just i don't know i do a lot um or i try to do a lot i try to keep busy I I work at a children's museum here in Richmond, um, and I've been there for just over just under two years doing exhibit builds and designs. And uh, I work; it's a nonprofit. It's really really fun to to work at, and just a very great uh, atmosphere to be around each each day. And then I'm also part time working for a, an audio visual company, and we do stage builds we'll do um a bunch of stuff some stuff i'm i have to be limited about what i say but uh yeah some stuff is is more fun than others but it's all (laughs) it's all good work um so i've helped build a lot of stages for a lot of cool bands that i never experienced or never thought i would and that was a lot of fun i mostly just hang out at the house with my wife and our cat uh carl with a k uh but yeah um yeah and then i do a lot (laughs) i know it doesn't sound like it but yeah a lot of like creative building stuff i like that it sounds like uh fulfilling work because you know building sets stages for bands and doing audio visual stuff that's still kind of tied into music and the arts so it's got to be fulfilling work absolutely yeah well, that's awesome. That is awesome. And uh, let's see, what's going on with me? I'm I'm trying to think if anything new is going on. I have to go to St. Louis Monday, and I really don't want to. Mm. Have you been there before? Yeah, I've been there a bunch of times for work, and I'm going back for work. But this is just a one-day gig. Fly in Monday, uh, go on site Tuesday, check things out, fly back out Tuesday. I'll be home late Tuesday night. One-day gig, that's fine. I can handle that. I got a week coming. I got a week off. Uh, coming up f- the week of Christmas. Okay. Uh, so I will I will spend that playing Warzone 2 again. Great. Uh, awesome. I'm st- yeah, I'm still working for my first win. And, you know, when I actually have time to sit around and do nothing, which is rare, I just game a lot usually because there's no other time to do it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's fair. And that's your time and you deserve it. So Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I've I've been working on a new band for the last couple years we practiced once or twice right before the pandemic hit and then i think a year later we started playing again and we're getting very close to having a full set so as soon as that's ready i'll start playing shows in new york city somewhere yeah that sounds awesome yeah i'm excited i haven't played a live gig since 2016 i think oh man okay yeah i wrote and released an EP with a band in 2018, mm-hmm. late 2018, but we broke up before we got to the first show. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, okay, yeah. Uh, see, uh, my my mindset was I was doing it too professional. I was like, we form the band, we write, we rehearse, we do a professional studio recording for this five song EP. So by the time the EP was actually recorded, people started leaving the band, and the whole thing fell apart. Now this time. I'm flipping it. As soon as we're ready to play a show, we're going out there and playing, and I'm worrying about the rest later. There you go. That's awesome. I think that's the way to do it. Yep. I mean, quoting Cat Moss, just get out there. It doesn't matter yes. what the recording sounds like. It, it just just do it. <laughs> so exactly, yeah. I'm taking her advice, which is my own advice now. <laughs> too. Exactly. And I'm just gonna go do it. Well, that's it. We are out of time, Greg. I want to thank you for coming on the show. I love the band. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm excited to hear more. Thank you so much, Keith. Uh, I love the podcast, and I am excited to hear more as well. And that's it. 
I'm back next week with a new episode and a new guest. So thanks everybody for listening and until next time. <laughs>